Uh, of course, it's called a, a reverse. Of course, yeah. Yeah, we, we've we've done a lot of those. Yeah. Hello, good, yeah, good local time, everyone. Yeah, when I was 14 years old, uh, not 13, uh, in middle school, uh, I convinced uh, the head of my school to uh, allow me to work anywhere, really, to continue my education on the then very new thing called the World Wide Web. Um, and I showed her the printouts of the email exchange that I had with researchers on the ARXIV, the archive network, which is still online, right? Uh, and maintained by Cornell University. Um, and so I think what makes sense to her was that to her, what's important is to make contributions to the society and to the academic community. And once I showed her that I'm already making such contributions, I just want to skip this whole diploma thing. Uh, she is completely okay with it and said um, that she will cover for me, meaning that she will fake the records. Uh, and so that really imbued in me this essence of optimism of the innovation capability of public service. Uh, and that strange condition has been with me ever since then. Yeah, I think uh, it took a couple of years. Certainly, uh, I didn't have that um, print out uh, when I was the first year in a junior high. When I did a science fair project that year, uh, the um, algorithmic uh, compression, actually, uh, it's um, actually it was a IBM patent. But anyway, uh, anyway, the uh, compression method <laughs> that I did the research on, I, I do it uh, mostly by my own research, and I didn't exchange any letters with uh, researchers. And when I'm on my uh, second year in middle school, my science fair project uh, was natural language processing and reasoning, um, in inference uh, logic. Uh, and for that, because it's a very cutting edge research domain, there's uh, scarcity of printed books available and most of the research is taking place online for natural language processing so I had no choice but to well learn English uh, and then write to the researchers uh, for my science fair project so really I think without the wild web community it would be impossible for me to formulate a case that there is actually something like a institution except of course free of admission fee all you have to bring is an email address Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, my main inspiration at that time is definitely just the people, random people that I met online. I was fascinated by this research question, why do people trust each other so easily online? 
uh, and form uh, social movements such as the Blue Ribbon Movement, uh, where people exchange links on their home pages, uh, or the Web Masters <laughs>、uh, exchange those links to support for the freedom of、uh, speech and so on online, which would lead directly to、um, well, Section 230 currently being debated very hotly in the U.S.、Uh, and all this、uh, community、um, that sprung up from the web.、Um, It's really counterintuitive if you think about it, because we've never met each other, yet we treat each other as families,、uh, and so that's very interesting a phenomena, and there's really no good explanation.、Uh, and uh, when I want to understand why this works,、uh, the only way for me to work is a interdisciplinary approach and a participatory approach, meaning that I have to code up、uh, such spaces myself. Uh, and、um, for example, I participated、uh, in the first、uh, C to C. What we call Coolbit, a eBay-like auction、um, website,、uh, the first one in Taiwan, and so through this kind of work of interaction design,、uh, I was then able to witness firsthand what's the pro-social part in social networks and the anti-social part too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first、uh, personal computer was、uh, a piece of A4 paper, and I drew using、uh, a, a pen、uh, the Q W E R T Y、uh, keyboard, and I would wake up and use a pencil.、Uh, I would press C L S Enter and write with my pencil C L S and take an eraser and erase everything that I wrote、uh, the previous day. So that's how I learned programming、uh, with just a introduction book on I think Apple II Basic or something.、Uh, Uh, but、uh, with no personal computer.、Uh, later on, of course, I would actually encounter a actual Apple、uh, personal computer, as well as, of course, IBM、uh, PC clones. <laughs> um, I lost your voice. You're muted. I I lost you at actually. That's right, and and I don't、uh, like touch screens. I never like touch screens. All my primary computing devices either were through keyboard or through a stylus. So that's Palm Pilot,、uh, Sharp Zorus.、Uh, nowadays, I use a Galaxy Note,、uh, and also Apple Pencil, of course.、Uh, and all this, I think, began when I start drawing my own keyboard, so to speak. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I didn't apply for the position. We invited ourselves in when we occupied the parliament、uh, for three weeks in 2014、uh, in the Occupy movement called the Sunflower Movement.、Uh, at the time, the、uh, parliament was having a conversation、um, about the Cross Strait Service and Trade Agreement or CSSTA,、uh, and the parliamentarians were refusing to deliberate、uh, substantially because of their interesting constitutional interpretation. Well, the idea is that when They don't do the substantial deliberation. People took their seat to did whatever we voted them to do、um, in their workplace, I guess.、Uh, and so people occupied the parliament to deliberate on the CSSTA, and more than twenty NGOs each deliberating on one particular aspect. For example, about whether we need to allow components from the PRC into the then new 4G infrastructure. Again, a conversation. People are having now worldwide, but anyway, we had that conversation back then with half a million people on the street and many more online. And through、uh, listening a skill, through the kind of technologies that I just alluded to, through social interaction design, we managed to get a very firm set of rough consensus on the street. 
which was then ratified by the head of the parliament and then also the cabinet later on. And so that gave us a sense of demonstration, not as a protest, but as a demo. It showed people it is actually possible for everyday population in the citizenry to have a real conversation about a very large issue such as a trade agreement. And so at the end of that year, um, all the mayor candidates that supported open government uh, won, sometimes surprisingly to them, uh, and all the mayor candidates that didn't support, well, didn't get elected. And so the reverse mentorship system was instated where the cabinet at the time recruited people younger than 35 years old, I was 33, at that year, um, as reverse mentors to members of the cabinet, essentially as interns, but also showing the new direction of what crowdsourcing, what open data, what open government can bring to the cabinet members. So I worked with uh, Jacqueline Tsai, a minister at the time. And so after Dr. Tsai Ing-wen became the president, I got, I guess, promoted from an intern into a full-time minister. Uh, and ever since then, I think the main um, change uh, in the cabinet is what nowadays we call digital transformation. What we understand is that the digitalization is not just about digitization, it's not just about turning face to face or uh, paper and pen into digits. Rather, it's about making sure that innovation from the society gets governed uh, in a collaborative fashion so that we can include more people and including non-voters and including future generations into the democracy. Essentially, prior to uh, the Sunflower Occupy, people didn't see democracy itself as a digital technology. But in the past three um, years or so, um, eventually we come to see in the entire cabinet and also in the population that democracy is a digital technology like any te digital technology. It gets better when people participate. Well, definitely. I think uh, when we first had our presidential election, that was 1996, uh, we are very aware of what it would be like if we have no freedom of press and freedom of assembly, because that was the martial law days, which continued until the late 80s. Uh, and so when the martial law was lifted, freedom of speech, assembly, the press, and so on, enabled the social sector which includes the social entrepreneurs, the co-ops, the charities, and so on, uh, basically the prototypes of the NGOs that would eventually occupy the parliament in 2014 uh, to gain legitimacy through placemaking. And uh, this is a point I think people in Japan would relate that any time there is a major earthquake, any time there is a major typhoon, of which there's many, right, uh, in, in a year, except this year where we didn't get any typhoon. But anyway, uh, on average, we get many chances for those social sector organizations to work together on disaster relief, on humanitarian work, and things like that. And so that improved the social communication on placemaking because it's everybody's business, so everybody helps. And that has been like that since the at least the age uh, and so when the presidential election happened in late 90s, the social sector organizations already have more than one decade of a head start when it comes to legitimacy building. So even today, when there is a natural disaster, when the Ministry of Interior publish a number and the largest charity publish a number, people tend to believe the charity's number. And that builds a legitimate structure that starts with the social sector so that the people in the government, no matter which ministry they work in, they always have to trust the citizens because the citizens are seen as more legitimate and the largest NGOs and largest charities more um, wise, I guess, because they exist uh, in a uh, like non-election, non-partisan influence timescale and has been able to build intergenerational solidarity, something that's uh, kind of difficult for a four-year term, um, you know, politicians to do.
Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, the social sector really had a lot of very good ideas, and the community placemaking is important too. For example, in the very early on, we understood that if three quarter of people wear this physical vaccine and have good hand sanitation、uh, habits, then the R value will be under one, meaning that the disease will not spread. Well, how do we make sure that people understand really how to use the mask and clean their hands properly? We worked with the community pharmacists. About six thousand of them, each not only have the professional credentials, but trusted by the community. And the elderly,、uh, for example, often frequented the pharmacies because they have chronic conditions that they refill their prescriptions、uh, to manage their condition. So we deliberately designed our mask rationing experience to be exactly the same as refilling a chronic. Prescription, and so in that sense, because the elders really trust the pharmacist. When the pharmacist say, "If you wear a mask, make sure you do this, this, this. Otherwise, the mask doesn't work." They make sure they remember it, and then、um, just spread the word, really, to their neighbors, to their friends, and to their younger family members. And so that is what enables、uh, the community resilience when it comes to the proper mask use, but also publishing the. Availability of medical mask in the pharmacies in real time every thirty seconds is also essential because first it builds trust. It's like a distributed ledger. People queuing in line can、uh, make an account of. However, many the masks that the people queuing before them have swiped their national health insurance card and purchased and check it on their own phone with a chatbot or a voice assistant or a map. And because of that, people believe that each other are acting in a fair fashion. And when、uh, data analysis experts、uh, look at real time numbers, they can suggest better distribution strategies for 24 hour convenience store pickup、uh, to make sure that the rural places、uh, the people pay the same. Amount of time instead of just physical distance、uh, to access the mask and so on, and all of those continuous improvements were done not only through parliamentary interpolations or uh, the um, feedback from the unions and associations of pharmacists, but also through anybody just calling the toll-free number one nine two two and tell us the good idea, the social innovation. Yeah, for example, how would we know that people are really washing their hands thoroughly、uh, in addition to wearing a mask? Where you can you look at the total water use、um, SCADA measurements in the operation technology,、uh, and we do actually look at that、uh, because it has no privacy infringement、uh, worries.、Uh, it is thoroughly anonymous, but we do look at how much people、uh, are using the water basins and the continuous、uh, throughput of that, especially in schools and so on. And it's very.、Um, Inspiring that、um, people 
do uh, wash their hands much more thoroughly when we introduce the cute dog, uh, a Shiba Inu. The name is Zong Chai, uh, and uh, teaching people how to wash their hands properly. There's even a song about it. But anyway, uh, so I, I think cute dogs uh, really is um, intergenerational. If uh, people see um, a cute dog and the name Song Chai, saying that um, you wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. Use a soap, wash your hand frequently. Um, this has a very high R value online. The younger people is happy sharing this to the older people. The elderly people when receive this is happy to share the poster around. It has no digital gap because a cute dog, well, nobody could be against a cute dog. Uh, and this is what we call humor over rumor. I think uh, the COVID has shown that our procurement strategy we instated four years ago, uh, which uh, is called a API first uh, procurement strategy has paid real dividends. Um, previously in Taiwan, we have a long tradition of universal access and accessibility. If a system integrator uh, build a website or a service and say, this is only for people with sight, but if people who uh, work with blind people, uh, people with blindness and so on, uh, cannot access this website, if they say, oh, you have to pay me 10 times more, two times more uh, for the procurement to work, actually they could get disqualified for being unprofessional and discriminate against people with blindness. And we piggybacked on that clause four years ago, saying that if you build only a website useful for human beings, but if you cannot talk in open API, that's machine to machine um, interface uh, as standardized by the Linux Foundation. And we used uh, open API version three at the time still at beta, but we say this is going to be our national standard. If any system integrators say, oh, I can only work with human users, but not robots. Well, they could be also disqualified for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but the effect is that. And so because of that, <laughs> all the uh, procure systems after that uh, are done uh, in a way that already have a API first description uh, so that the modularity of the systems uh, can be ensured. So when we, for example, needed a mask rationing system to work online on the mobile phone, we just uh, plugged the API from the National Health Insurance app into the API of the tax filing software for personal income taxes. Uh, and in just 72 hours, those API match, and then you can start pre-ordering in convenience stores for picking up the masks uh, on your phone. Uh, and when we want to issue the triple stimulus vouchers, which essentially enable you to spend uh, 3,000 uh, NT dollars and withdraw from your nearby friendly automated teller machine to um, third of that back as a cash back. Again, we can just modify that piece of software and hook in the API of the convenience stores uh, uh, terminals and so on. And so all this uh, showed that while the work, the demand is more complex, if you have good API first building blocks that have already passed cybersecurity um, inspections, penetration testing, defense at depth, and things like that, then you can just assemble them when the situation calls for it. And my job is not actually more complicated because the complexity is managed by those API building blocks. Yeah, and if they think it's not being taken care of, we're just one toll-free number away. They can call us saying, oh, you're giving me pink medical mask. I'm a boy. I don't want to wear it to school. And then the next day, everybody on the press conference will wear pink medical masks. And so the boy become the most hit boy in the class.
Yeah, uh, one example is the mask availability map was initially prototyped using the Google Map API, the Places API to be uh, precise, which enables such a rapid prototyping. The problem was, of course, the young civic technologist, the name is Howard Wu, who prototyped this just, you know, went to lunch and his map went to the national news. By the time he finished lunch, he already owed Google, I think, 20K US dollars in API usage fees. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's, a, that's a real challenge for him. So uh, then he uh, shared on the Gov0, G0V.TW, which is the equivalent of Code for Japan in Taiwan, uh, saying that, OK, I owe Google a lot of money. What should I do? Is there a way to save money? And of course, people uh, from the OpenStreetMap community from many other communities chimed in. And, but I'm also one of the civic technologists on the channel. So I immediately uh, just called up uh, the uh, premier's office. And later on, in I think the very next day, I would show the premier the work that Howard would have done and say, we have to support them no matter what. Uh, and so what's important is then for Google, uh, their uh, CSR department, uh, to be precise, uh, recognize the importance of this um, cross-sectoral collaboration. Not only they waived the API fee, but also they supported through the Google Developer Group in Tainan the development to make this uh, thing work, not only in convenience stores, but also in pharmacies. Later on, of course, there will be more than 100 different implementations, including by the HTC team for a line chatbot, and also eventually um, the Google Assistant, uh, Siri, and things like that. So all the different enterprise uh, contributors all chimed in because of the uh, great uh, public cost that this uh, essentially a, a massive hackathon uh, is having on the society. But really, if not for the uh, Google Developer Group's uh, initial kindness and the initial recognition of the importance of this uh, committee work, then it would take Howard Wu much more time and resources uh, to get this prototype started. Uh, and so I think in-kind dedications such as this is very essential and important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm working with the Taiwanese government, but I'm not working for the Taiwanese government. I'm working with the people and not for the people. I see myself more like a ambassador uh, from the internet community, which is a worldwide community, even extraterrestrial. I hear that they're building 4G telecom towers on moon now. Uh, but anyway, uh, a uh, truly interplanetary community uh, that uh, makes this uh, digital uh, infrastructure together is made in the world uh, and then independent countries of course may choose uh, the terms upon which to negotiate uh, with the internet community but I uh, my allegiance is first and foremost uh, to the Internet Open Innovation community. And so when Gov0 uh, worked with Code for Japan on the Mandarin translation for the Stop COVID-19 Tokyo Metropolitan Dashboard, actually I'm just one of the many translators and I'm mostly working in a proofreading uh, fashion because as you mentioned, I don't have so much time to work on this. Uh, but when I noticed that the uh, people who worked on the dashboard uh, did a bulk import of the spreadsheet of the translations, they forgot the uh, first row. They, the first row is the name of the languages. Uh, so um, the uh, Taiwanese Mandarin, for example, uh, is rendered uh, as uh, a uh, Nihongo uh, character T, uh, which is a, um, a, a different ideograph uh, in Taiwan using much more uh, strokes. Uh, and so because of that, uh, I just noticed this when they bulk imported 
the um, translation lexicon, uh, and because my specialization is actually in internationalization and localization, uh, and so I just found uh, their dictionary JSON file, uh, or was it the YAML file? Uh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter, and then change the data structure uh, so that that particular character uh, is reflected, but it's just a one character change, and most of the work were done by the GovZero people, which I, again, consider my primary community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So Gov0, which started in 2012, is this brilliant domain hack. All the government websites in Taiwan ends with something that gov that tw. So the Gov0 people register something that g0v that tw. So for each and every government digital service that you don't like, instead of just shouting and protesting about it, well, you can fork it. And so the call to action of Gov0 is to fork the government. Um, important pronunciation, fork the government. Uh, and so for all the digital services, for example, the national participation portal is join the GOV, the TW. If you change your O to a zero, then you get into the shadow government, which is always more fun and open source and relinquishing most of the copyright. So when the government think, hey, it's a good idea to visualize the budget or to visualize uh, the regulatory pre-announcements and so on, when it's prototyped by Gov0, at any given time, the government can say, okay, it's a good idea let's merge the fork and just take it and become the mainstream government services which is exactly what Cover Japan did for the Tokyo metropolitan government because they just built a website on github and all they ask is a official domain name which eventually uh, they got from the Tokyo metropolitan government Certainly. So when I first became the digital minister, there were no digital ministers in Taiwan before, right? So I kind of have to write my own job description. So always start with a good job description uh, because you only have one chance <laughs> in, in writing that. Uh, and in, in the job description, uh, the most important thing is to make sure that people understand that digitalization is about connecting people to people. IT or ICT, information and communication technology, is connecting machine to machines. But that's just a means. The goal is to connect people to people, which is digital. So to make sure that people understand the difference between IT and digitalization, um, my job description is literally a poem, which goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So if I'm uh, having an advice for the Japanese equivalent, maybe write some, I don't know, haiku uh, or anything that makes it easy for people to remember. Definitely, 
um, in Taiwan, we have more than 20 national languages, uh, the majority of which are indigenous. Uh, also, the sign language is an official language too. The reason why that we take so much time to get the National Languages Act right is that we want to make sure that there is nothing that we do about people without the people's participation. So diversity is what you see on the surface, but the value is really about inclusion, about <clears throat> making sure that even people who are previously accustomed of uh, having a conversation in Mandarin or uh, understand the uh, mathematical logic uh, behind the everyday algorithms and so on can all using whatever tradition they have, maybe it's an oral tradition about the spirit of the mountains and the rivers, and they can use these metaphors, which is great for sustainability actually, uh, to make their own arguments and to make sure that in their city councils, in the legislation and so on, there's sufficient number of assistive intelligence around that will resonate uh, their ideas with uh, everybody else. And so when we have a transcultural view on any emergent phenomena, it's far easier then to settle on universal common values that are fundamentally human values. But if one culture dominates over the others, then it's very easy to make biased choices in the name of progress while sacrificing alternate points of view. So just like biodiversity, cultural diversity is important if you want to make your work sustain across generations. A lot of people think that uh, for the new immigrants uh, in Taiwan, uh, we need to be even more friendly, and I totally concur. There's also people who argue that uh, the younger generation are getting more and more comfortable with English. So even though English is at the moment not a national language in the National Languages Act, uh, maybe 10 years down the road, we can make English a working language too. Uh, and so we can always use more diversity. Uh, and while, of course, we're the first country in Asia to legalize marriage equality, uh, it's not all about marriage only, right? There's also the right of intersex, of transgender people, and things like that, of which, of course, we're continuing the work. No, it's the values that they need to instill in us because it's always the younger generation showing the direction of the future and the older generation, I'm older than 35 now, I no longer qualify as a reverse mentor. So I have my own reverse mentor, younger than 35 now, showing me the direction of the future. And I think uh, what's important is that even for people below 18 years old, below the uh, age of consent or voting age, Actually, these are the people that uh, care the most about the future because they will be at the receiving end of climate change and other systemic issues. Uh, and so they tend to have the most ability and motivation uh, to mobilize. And that can be seen in our national participation platform, the join platform. The most active group is people around 15 years old. And then the next one is around 65 years old. I guess these two groups both care about the next generation and also have a lot of time on their hands, apparently. Uh, and so uh, intergenerational solidarity is important. And the other thing is that we need to make sure that the younger people think themselves not as consumers of media or consumers of narratives or of data. And that's why starting last year, we removed the term literacy from our curriculum for the K-12. Because when you say media literacy, you kind of assume that it's the adults, the people who have power to make TV series, to make radio stations and things like that. And the younger people just listen or just watch. And that's what literacy means because it's a kind of one-way flow. 
But nowadays, because in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. Each and every young person anywhere in Taiwan, they're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second uh, broadband uh, both ways, unlimited for just 15 US dollars a month. Otherwise, it's my fault. So each and every one of them are capable media producers. Anytime they can just start a live stream and they become essentially news workers. And so because of that, they need to learn everything that a news worker learns, which is journalistic attitude, investigative reporting, uh, the importance of checking their sources, the importance of the framing effect and balancing of the narratives, and so on. And all this uh, cannot be taught by a standardized answer way. All of this need to be learned in a way that is participatory, for example, fact checking each and every uh, presidential candidates uh, during our presidential debates and forums uh, last December and this January, uh, a lot of middle schoolers and even some primary schoolers participated in the fact checking team uh, working with professional uh, media workers. And so that is what I mean by media competence. And the same goes for data. If they can produce data, curate and steward uh, the data on uh, air pollution, water water pollution, everyday uh, measurements, then they also learn what does it mean to have a joint data controllership? Uh, what does GDPR really mean? Uh, which is impossible to teach unless you are in a data steward uh, position. And so just build competence and let them lead the way and they can instill the newer, better values in us, the older people. Yeah, that, 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 yes, yes. And, and that's reverse mentorship, right? We invite them in to the cabinet and also to each and every city council and ministry and so on, so that they can at any given time, even just hold this workshop themselves uh, with 20 somethings running the show and inviting teenagers uh, to the workshop. And just as you described, to surface any local like economic issue or a global climate change issue uh, or labor conditions uh, or plastic waste uh, or whatever anything that they care about they can hold up such a deliberative workshop and not only are those workshops funded by the youth development agency in our ministry of education but actually we would ask the public servants to respond point by point to the consensus uh, information that is gathered by those deliberative uh, workshops. So this has been going on for quite a while, I think for at least a decade, and it really instilled in people who are not even 18 years old this feeling that democracy is something that they can participate and they can change. And so not only do they vote more, but also they know that it's not just about voting for people, it's also about choosing uh, the budgetary items, about innovating in the sandbox system, about getting a team running on the presidential hackathon, about starting a citizen's initiative on a joint platform, which is nowadays also a civics class assignment uh, from uh, many different uh, middle schools and so on. Uh, and so all this makes sure that they become citizens even before that they reached the age of 18. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> and that's every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, I'm in the social innovation lab, making sure that anyone uh, can walk into the park is essentially a park because we took down all the walls uh, and just, you know, talk for 40 minutes at a time. But the only thing that I ask is that it's radically transparent, meaning that it will always be on the record as either a transcript or a radio, uh, sorry, a video. Uh, and so, or radio, maybe I should do radio. Yeah, so, so this is the Social Innovation Lab and people do come in. And because, uh, as you um, have seen, this is very creative architecture. 
public art made by people with Down syndrome. So people who come in automatically become more creative and get inspired. For example, the mayor of Prague City, uh, Zdenek Hrib, uh, when he first visited uh, his cabinet, uh, just climbed on the structure. It's not designed for climbing, by the way. Uh, and because they are so inspired, they just do that. And fortunately, it's, it's very sturdy material. Uh, and then people uh, who see, for example, uh, shopping carts, uh, really self-driving vehicles, uh, can work on the digitization, innovation, governance, and inclusion of the co-domestication and together solve the alignment and accountability problem for the self-driving vehicles and so on. So the open office hours is an invitation for everybody in the society to think about what kind of ideas if spread and understood by the majority of people, like wearing masks, uh, can have a systemic change uh, effect on the society for the better. Oh, it's very diverse. Um, I think the oldest uh, group uh, was a group of five or six, and the average age in that group was 80 years old, if not older. Uh, and they work on uh, the uh, uh, framing of calligraphies. So I still have some calligraphies that they send me as a gift. And they are very happy that we have a universally accessible elevator and an air bridge and so on. Very friendly for people in wheelchairs and so on. Uh, and the youngest group, I think, is around six to seven years old, kindergarten and also first year in the primary school. And they uh, work with their teachers to interview me and they have some very good questions. Yeah, uh, one of them asked uh, what would be uh, the future of uh, humanity if we think outside of Earth. One of them uh, heard that uh, there's a group of people building um, embassies uh, for aliens and they want to know my take on it. Uh, are there extraterrestrials? And to which I responded, of course, just look at the International Space Station. There's quite a few ETs there, uh, and so on. <laughs> right, but, but they're very creative. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think uh, in particular around digital learning uh, and digital working are the two uh, transformations that uh, because of COVID has rapidly accelerated in both Taiwan and Japan. Um, I remember the workshop that I held, I think it was last year before the COVID on teleworking and people were kind of pessimistic about whether Japan can truly adopt teleworking, even with 5G technology. But nowadays, I'm like, wow, Japan has really embraced teleworking, uh, and uh, it, it has become a, a norm, and uh, all this kind of um, um, lingering um, ideas about, for example, having to travel all the way to the office to apply the official seal, uh, now has kind of faded away because of COVID. People understand that a electronic seal or an electronic signature is actually much more safe and, and more fun too because you can get more <laughs> variations and because we, we had that change uh, for uh, the seal and also teleworking uh, starting 2015 and uh, finished uh, the transformation by 17 uh, or so so I mean we lead the way that's true but not too much uh, we still remember very vividly how it was four years ago or five years ago. So there's a lot of ways that we can work together. Now for telecare, that's something that Japan leads the way because, well, your aging situation uh, leads uh, ours. <laughs> and so uh, to enable people who are very senior to still contribute meaningfully to the society through assistive technology, that is something that 
Taiwan can definitely learn from Japan. But for these two things uh, to work across distance, but also still feeling very close and to learn with each other, including for lifelong learning for the very elderly to teach, but also learn from the younger people. This, I think, are shared values uh, by both societies and both society agree that it's ultimately the society that's more advanced, society 5.0, need to lead industry 4.0. Uh, and that is also something that we can collaboratively share with the world, because nowadays the world is uh, caught in a kind of dilemma between surveillance capitalism on one side and authoritarian intelligence on the other. And the people-powered way, the collective intelligence way, the society 5.0 way, I think is not just a middle ground. It is actually not left wing or right wing, it's up wing. It's something that will really lift the humanity up. And that argument Japan and Taiwan should make together to the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure, I always quote uh, my favorite poem from Leonard Cohen, and, and I will quote it again. And it goes like this. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. And I wish you all live long and prosper. ありがとうございました。